Alrighty, thank you for the introduction and thank you for tuning into my talk here, a general approach to automating your deployment process. So what is this about? You know, my fancy title here <laughs> aside. Well, in any given deployment, whether for infrastructure, code, networking, some combo of all of the above, or maybe even more, our ideal, so our end goal, is often the automation of said deployment. You know, and in this journey, we're going to uh, generally see two camps here. The first camp is so interested in the details and technology that they wind up missing the forest for the trees. And by that, I mean they'll lose sight of the end goal of automation. Why? Well, because they're so caught up in the implementation and doing more faster, right, that the end result uh, winds up being rushed or even worse, confined to some local maximum that discounts the future or, or a variety of different edge cases. But on the other hand, the second camp will get so caught up in the higher level phases, so planning, 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 more planning, uh, throw in some business jargon and buzz terms, that they'll miss the trees for the forest. <laughs> and by that, I mean they'll stretch out and overcomplicate the process and implementation so much that the end result is arguably worse than just doing things manually. Uh, suddenly, their pipeline requires more engineering than the applications being deployed. But wait. What is the end goal of automating your deployment? Well, I'm gonna tell you, it's not a continuous integration and deployment pipeline. The end goal here is not the forest or the trees. An automated pipeline for your deployments is just a tool, if you will, to achieve the desired end goal, and that is to save time and reduce error. Yeah, I know, duh, okay, okay, right, mm, no. That may seem obvious, but when you've been in it long enough and you've built enough of these pipelines and talked to others out there that have done the same, you'll really start questioning whether or not that this is the end goal, right? You go to any meetup and ask anyone about their automation pipelines and uh, be prepared because the majority of them are going to be either the most complicated, long-winded piece of engineering that you've heard about or they'll be so simplistic, you'll wonder why they even have one. Now, obviously this isn't the rule, yeah, but honestly, sometimes I wonder <laughs> if it is. So in this talk, we're gonna go through key points that make up a general approach that you can take to avoid of falling into either of these two camps, both of which are forest on the forest and trees, but I've often forgotten that we're actually just trying to get out of the damn forest. So. Who am I? Well, my name is Cole Morrison, and I'm currently a developer advocate at HashiCorp. Now, I've spent the past 10 years in the industry primarily in software engineering and startups, though the previous four have mainly been in DevOps, both teaching and doing. Now, if you followed me at all before, taken any of my courses, read any of my blogs, well, then you know I've spent a good amount of time talking about automation pipelines and building them. Well, it turns out that when you're in startups and you're building things from scratch, uh, or you consult them, you wind up building a lot of automation pipelines. And so better or for worse, I've gotten pretty good at the process, and as you can imagine, I've got a lot to say on it. So let's go ahead and get into it. I'm gonna show you all the things that we're gonna cover here today. So uh, from the many years of going through this process, uh, these are a list of seven ideas slash techniques, you know, whatever you want to call them, uh, that I use for automating deployments. Now, a couple of things here. First, these are in order. You should do them in this order. Second, some of them may seem obvious, but I have some things to say around them that may not be so obvious. And third, just a terminology thing, when I say pipeline, I'm referring to our end result. So a series of automated or manual processes that complete your deployment. Okay, so first thing, that is to do things manually first. All right, I know this may sound obvious, and it is, so let's go ahead and skip to the non-obvious part. When we're seeking to create a product for users, the first step is to what? Well, it's to identify the pain points and problems that the users are looking to solve. The product then becomes a solution. However, when setting up engineering solutions and pipelines, all too often we experience the, the problem once, twice, thrice, and then suddenly we decide that we're ready to build the whole pipeline. Hmm. How much do we really understand the ins and outs of what we're trying to solve? If we've only experienced the pain a handful of times. Probably not much. 
right? And jumping the gun here is what leads to solutions that have an incredibly low or skewed local maximum. So what I mean by that is that the solution you come up with may have a ceiling that it can't go beyond. Uh, think of it like building a factory, right? A certain size and setup of a factory may be perfect for creating a thousand widgets a month, right? Uh, but the second you need to create 10,000 widgets a month, well, it'll either be super slow or impractical because the factory wasn't built to do that because it didn't consider those things or that growth. Now this, I know this may sound like, oh, well, this is only for teams that you know rush and build their pipeline, right? No, because I have another curve on here, so the red one that represents overthinking the pipeline. So this would be like trading a factory that, for building millions of widgets a month, but you currently only produce a thousand. Well, operating infrastructure designed for millions of widgets only to only produce a thousand is a lot of unnecessary overhead. So the first thing to do here isn't just to do things manually first, it's to do things manually many times first, all right? So you do this because it gives you a variety of experiences and perspectives through repetition so that you can truly understand the pain points and problems you're trying to solve. Now, the more times you go through this process, the more you'll experience edge cases, unknowns, and come up with ideas that you wouldn't see if you just hopped right into trying to build things. Now, there's a quote I love parroting from Socrates, and that's understanding a question is half the answer, and that's what we're doing here. Okay, fine, cool, you know, but how long should I do this? Well, the answer is going to vary for each team and project, but my rule of thumb is until it becomes routine. You and I both know what that means, right? It means your deployment is just another thing that you do. You can't, have choo you can't of course, choose to move on earlier or later, depending upon your needs, uh, but the earlier you move on, the less you're gonna truly understand things, and the later you move on, well, the more you'll understand things. But regardless of when you choose to move on from this step, there is something you must produce, and that is what I like to call a human automation script, <laughs> which is uh, really just a thorough step-by-step. -step. And what do I mean by this? Uh, what I mean is that before you leave this step, you should produce a document that outlines every single thing that you do as a human to complete your deployment process. So how detailed should it be? Well, it should be so detailed that it could be a Friday before you're going to be gone and unreachable for a week, and you could hand this script to a junior ops or developer and be confident that they are going to do the deployment for themselves, and it's going to be completely successful. <laughs> so step-by-steps, steps, edge cases, uh, consider things to look for, and how to solve problems that come up human automation scripts. And whether you know it or not, from this script, you've created this solid foundation upon which all of our next steps stand upon. And so let's go ahead and move on to that next step. And the next step is to define the ideal workflow. So at this point, we've got the devil you know, and that's this manual process, right? And surely some of you have been on teams where the pro for your project were step one, so having those manual steps is what you stopped at. But it's frustrating, time consuming, and since manual, good old fashioned human error uh, can throw everything into chaos. But before you go building things, our next step is to figure out exactly how we'd like this process, this new automated process to work from a human perspective. And what I mean by this is to ask yourself, how would I want to work with this pipeline? We already know what the end result of the pipeline should be. That's the complete your deployment. But right now we're doing all these manual steps in that human automation script that we made. So after the pipeline is complete, what would that script look like then? So for example, when I was at Field Boom trying to define our team's ideal workflow, it was version control based. I wanted to do this. I wanted to make some changes to my infrastructure as code, pull requests into our production branch, check to see these changes on a staging environment. If they're good, merge them into the production branch and then ultimately have that merge trigger the deployment automatically, right? So I wanted five steps all inside of GitHub, all in code with everything else moved out of the way. This was the ideal workflow that I wanted to create for our team. And the above here more or less became my new human automation script. And as you can see, you know, this was something I could hand off to anyone well-versed in GitHub or Git. And by the way, uh, at the time, I literally had never heard of the term GitOps before uh, when putting this together. 
Now, when you're coming up with this workflow, you want to be pretty detailed what you want out of it. And you also don't want to judge it too hard. So what I mean uh, is, the, is the whole like, is this even possible? Like that question, you can kind of silence that voice for now and uh, let your imagination run wild. Uh, because don't worry, uh, we'll crush those dreams uh, later. <laughs> All right, so we've got what we're doing. So our manual step-by-step, -step, and we've also got our new ideal workflow that we want to move towards. It's now time to move on to our third step, and that is to research existing tools, ideas, and methodologies. Again, this is not the time to begin building. Instead, it's to see what's out there. You see, you don't want to start trying to construct the pipeline if your mental toolbox is limited. Now, why? Well, uh, let me just throw up another favorite quote of mine, which is, if the only tool you have is a hammer, well, then you tend to see every problem as a nail. This is the exact trap we are looking to escape from. And it goes beyond just equipping yourself with better tooling, but also getting up to speed with better ideas, paradigms, and also existing workflows that others have discovered. You know, this is so you don't wind up reinventing the wheel with sticks and stones, which would be a massive waste of time. Uh, the thing is, unless you're building some one-of-a-kind pipeline, and I'm just going to say it, you're more than likely not, other people out there have walked a similar path and have experiences they can share. Other teams and companies have created projects with similar needs and created tooling and techniques to get it done. And now is the time to begin researching, right? So why now as opposed to the beginning, right? Because a lot of engineers will hop right into this step just as much as others will try to hop right into building. And this is generally the area where our engineer Alice will go down the rabbit hole and never be seen again. Well, the difference is that if you follow the first two steps, you have a compass and a North Star to follow. You know exactly what you're looking for. This makes the research far more productive because, you know, if you don't know where you're headed, then any road is going to take you there. So a cautionary tale of my own way back in 2015 uh, with an earlier startup, uh, we had our product up on managed rack space and we were more or less doing everything by hand in a few scripts. I mean, I guess we'd just set up on Semaphore CI, so I guess there wasn't that. However, the ideas of cloud computing as it is today, infrastructure as code, you know, those weren't even on our radar. Those mental models weren't in our toolbox and so we didn't even consider that as an approach and thus, the pipeline that we created uh, for our deployment wasn't what it could have been. So maybe infrastructure as code is now on your radar. Well, if you have Terraform in your mental toolbox, then what you can build is far beyond uh, what someone without it can. And if you're still spitting up load balancers for every service in your stack, uh, well, maybe it's time to go and figure out what a service mesh is and use something like HashiCorp Console. And oh, hey, HashiTalks deploy here, right? We've had quite a few talks on Kubernetes. And if you're wondering, hey, can deploying this, uh, this to this beast be less of a labyrinth? Well, maybe it's time to check out HashiCorp Waypoint. The more tools and ideas you have, the better. Now, the biggest pitfall here is truly analysis paralysis. We all know what that is and what it feels like, and there really isn't a straightforward trick here because how much time you can dedicate to research is going to be different based on your situation. Your budget, team, deadlines, you know, all these factors will come into play, but you must set a cutoff. You must say something like, I will spend X days, or I will research Y number of options, and then I will move on. And move on to what? Well, our fourth step, and that is to pick your tools and methodologies. Oh, duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, but never underestimate analysis paralysis combined with the paradox of choice. Because once you bring your head up from all the research you've done, uh, you're probably going to find yourself overwhelmed with you know, the number of options available to you. And decisions are hard. <laughs> After all, if you pick the wrong tools, uh, as we've discussed in the beginning, you can wind up with a very limiting or inappropriate local maximum. Now, I have all sorts of nightmare anecdotes here from going with the wrong choice because picking the right tools and technologies to invest your time and skills in is a much larger bet with much bigger consequences than we often talk about. And why? Well, because if we pick the wrong ones and we invest, say, a year of our time and the next year the tool is outdated, unsupported, or becomes the lesser option in the marketplace, 
our value decreases and we wind up having to learn all over again. And that's just from a personal standpoint. From a business standpoint, unless you've got enough clout to make whatever vendors you're going with stick around and keep up support, you're likely going to have a painful migration in the future, right? I mean, call me short-sighted, but years ago, I couldn't fathom of why infrastructure as a service would ever overtake platform as a service. I really did think that things like Heroku and all of those other similar services out there were the future. And obviously, I was wrong. <laughs> and all of my knowledge around those failed pass options is now pretty much useless. Anyhow, I have some criteria that if you keep up with my other courses and videos you may have seen before, but there's five criteria that I use to pick technologies. Now, the first one is how familiar I am or how familiar my team is with the tool or technology. The reason this question is important to ask is because the more in-house experience uh, you have with the tool already, well, the faster and better you'll be able to move. However, the more important side here is that if you have existing experience, you have a much better view of what the thing can actually and truly do. Because as we know, marketing and sales speak can be somewhat misleading. Now, the second is super critical, and that is documentation, community knowledge, and usage levels. I don't care how flashy the tool is. Uh, uh, or the technique looks. I don't care how cute their mascot is, and I don't care how big their latest funding round is. If the docs are terrible, building it is going to be an uphill process. If there is no community, answering edge cases and tackling hard problems is going to be a lonely, frustrating journey. And if not a lot of people are using it, you know how can you even be sure that it'll achieve the scale that you want? Now, the thing is, when choosing a tool, you kind of have to ask yourself, do I want to be the trailblazer for this thing or do I want to build what I set out to build? Do you want to be the one who discovers all of the bugs and oddities or do you want to build the thing that you wanted to build? Well, probably the latter. So if these elements are missing from an option, it's probably not an option. Okay, third, and this is something I've made uh, many a mistake in ignoring and that is the track record of the creators and maintainers. Uh, so the other two elements are great, but now we need to look at who's behind this option. Is it an individual or a company? Are they active in maintaining and updating their product or is it a ghost town? Are they receptive to community ideas and feedback or are they set in their ways? You have to understand that if you're going to pick a tool to serve as the foundation of some critical aspect of your stack or product, well, you better be sure it's going to be active. You know, back in 2017, when I was tasked with doing what we're doing, what we're talking about here, right? So setting up a pipeline, but also building in a cloud infrastructure. Well, Terraform was uh, still in like 0 0.11, right? And as cool as it looked, I'd been burned before by going with options based on what I want to call buzz factor, right? So I wound up in cloud formation, and obviously I was quite wrong uh, in my estimation of Terraform. Uh, however, at the time, what I was confident about was that AWS would be around. Now, I did wind up moving over to, over to Terraform about a year later, but that's a different story for a different time. And obviously now much of the world that's using infrastructure as code has standardized in Terraform. So maybe this isn't the best anecdote for this point, but you get the picture. So next up, functionality. Does it do what you need it to? Again, super obvious, like most good advice, but it's not always followed. Uh, we look at the different tooling and we see, oh, the Fortune 500 use it. Oh, all the fang companies use it. Uh, and our human brains, oh, so susceptible to social proof. I look around and say, well, then it must be good enough for me. But since you have a very clear idea of what needs to be done, uh, you should be cross-referencing both your ideal workflow and your manual step-by-steps you've made with the tools that you're evaluating. And how do you evaluate that? Well, if you've already vetted it for documentation, community knowledge, and usage levels, it should be pretty easy to figure out if it can do what you need it to. And if you're having trouble figuring that out, well, then you probably didn't evaluate the tool in context of number two on our list here. So finally, number five here, what is more important and viable for you in this tool, control or convenience? What I mean by this is that most tools will generally fall on one of two sides, which is doing a lot for you automatically or giving you all the pieces and expecting for you to set it up. 
Another way that this is generally worded is how low level or high level the tooling is. Uh, so are you working with a bunch of primitives and piecing together the larger system? Or do you have a convenient binary, for example, that you just pass a few settings to and then move on? Now, the right answer here is, of course, dependent upon your ideal workflow way back from the earlier step. Uh, for some teams and people, more control is going to be required. And for others, the automatical black box is all that they need. The trade-off here, though, is, of course, that with more control comes far more responsibility and therefore required time and resources. However, with more convenience, you're often left with less optionality, meaning that if your needs don't fit the main use cases of this tool, uh, you may spend many, many, many moons uh, hacking up workarounds. Okay, so... That was a pretty long segue, uh, but this is a very critical step. Infrastructure and pipelines aside, picking tools and technologies and methodologies are one of the most important things that we do in technology, both personally and professionally. What you choose to learn and invest your time into can either make you the next Kubernetes operator, or it can make you the next modulus.io operator. And if you don't know what that is, it's because it's not around anymore. Okay, so after all that, we're gonna zoom back up to our larger list of steps here to number five, and that is to create a hypothesis and plan of implementation. So you've got your tools and methodologies picked out. Now we need to draft an approach. Uh, what do we think we need to do? Uh, and how do we think we need to get all these pieces together to get our pipeline up and running? And this is less about creating some scrumified workflow to get it all created. You know, Sure, that's a component, but there's really two things you need to look out for here. So the first is to resolve conflicts between your human automation script, your ideal workflow, and what's actually possible. This is where we take all the dreams of your, your ideal workflow and realize that a fraction of them, or maybe even more, aren't possible. Now, my own experience was realizing how difficult multiple deploys were with confirmation when it came uh, to race conditions, updating only parts of the infrastructure, and collaborating with multiple people on the project. Now, unfortunately, I didn't pay enough attention to those aspects of it, and our workflow, at least for some time, wound up with this whole uh, stand in line and wait scenario, whereby if I, if you know, one fix was going out, then all the other activity needed to freeze. The next thing is to get your team members and stakeholders input into what should be in the final pipeline. Again, this should seem obvious and maybe everyone else got lucky, but if you've never been in a workflow where one SRE or lead engineer is the bottleneck for all of your deployments, well, then you're lucky. Uh, because it's not fun, especially if they're the one who built it and they're absolutely convinced that it's the only way. Again, good advice is often self-evident, but truly, how many of us talk with our users regularly, uh, aggregate team feedback, and dog food our own products? Mm, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the end thing you're putting together is a plan of implementation. The more people involved, well, the more project management you'll likely have to impose, but going into that aspect, you know, and how you might manage this is beyond the uh, scope of this talk. But you have the plan, it's now time to hop to this step that many of us just jump right to, and that is to build the automation pipeline. Now, what else is there to say here? At this point, you're going to implement your plan and, getting this, and, and get this wonderful pipeline built. However, there is one main piece of advice that I hope you'll take to heart when doing this, and it is this. To build it simply, but leave room for extensibility. The biggest trap here is over-engineering your pipeline into something you might need years from now instead of creating what you need for this year. If we take another look at that chart I showed earlier, again, this is the equivalent of building a factory designed to produce a million widgets when you're only producing a thousand right now. However, the opposite is just as bad, which is why the second part of this statement is just as important, and that is to leave room for extensibility. If you're going to over-engineer somewhere, it should be this aspect, the aspect of extensibility. So let's say uh, you know, you're building your infrastructure as code with Terraform, uh, well, it might be tempting to do the whole thing in a single project in the root module, uh, but it's gonna be problematic as the infrastructure grows. Whether because, you know, everything has to be maintained as one, deployed as one, you know, there's many reasons. However, a pattern that's going to leave you with extensibility while still keeping simplicity is going to be to just go ahead and start splitting things into smaller modules. 
So, you know, maybe you've got one for your network, one for your compute, one for your data, and so on. Uh, although this is a bit tangent about Terraform, when constructing your pipelines uh, for deploying your infrastructure, being able to maintain the different aspects of it as, as modules goes a very long way. It allows teams to work in parallel, deployments to happen independently, and of course, more reusability. However, what's more important here is the thought process, right? If you're already building with the module mindset, then you're already thinking about creating code that can easily integrate with other code. This means you can start with a simple set of modules and you can add more as you need them versus keeping everything in one big blob and inadvertently playing infrastructure Jenga. But anyhow, that is the one thing to take to heart here. Build it simply, but leave room for extensibility. Okay, so we are on our final point, which is what comes afterwards. Well, that is to evolve our automation pipeline through iteration and feedback. So now we're actually back at the beginning of our list here. You see what happens is there's still some manual component of our pipeline more than likely. So I gave my ideal workflows earlier and maybe, uh, maybe this is what it winds up looking like after our whole process is said and done the first time. Well, if we're trying to evolve this, what should I do? Well, if you're following our general approach here, it's to do this process many times. As I do this many times, just as when I began, I'm going to continue encountering pain points, problems, and oversights that maybe I didn't see before. And as I familiarize myself with this new workflow, maybe I define a new ideal workflow. Something that would come about by talking you know, with the different stakeholders and aggregating all of our experiences into this. And you probably see where I'm going here. And that's that this approach is recursive. When I hit step seven, it's time to go all the way back to step one and begin again. And this is how you move forward with continuous improvement. This is how, you know, after defining our ideal workflow, you know, we do more research, figure out what's changed. And now we're going to be asking better questions now because we have more information. And from there, we'll pick our new tool and methodologies to further improve our pipeline, form a new plan of implementation and build it. And then the next thing you know, we've completed the process again, and our pipeline is even better. I bring this up because once we've completed this process the first time we have that initial version of the pipeline, it's very easy to become complacent. I myself am guilty uh, of this, even though I complained about being uh, dealing with lead SREs and stuff that are bottlenecks, I of course, you know, I've certainly played that role myself. And it's never intentional. And we stop here, you know, we get this up so we can move on to other things and our focuses just change. But the question of when to do this next iteration, let alone when to do this in general, well, is it in alignment with our original goals of automating our deployment process, which is what again? When it saves time and reduces error. And how much? When it's so much that the time that you save from building this pipeline outweighs the time it takes to build it. So these are the steps for a general approach to automating your deployment process. There are generally two camps that we fall into. Those of us that miss the forest for the trees because we're so zoomed in on implementation, we're doing more faster and better. And then those of us who don't even realize the forest is made up of trees because we're so high level, overthinking and over engineering it that it takes forever to build. But neither are the end goal. The end goal is to get out of the forest. In our case, save time and reduce error. If your automation for your deployment isn't doing that, well, then what was the point of any of it? Thank you so much. Again, my name is Cole Morrison, and I hope you enjoyed the talk.